kindly note that the event will start in another 10 minutes. A very good morning to everyone on behalf of the council. I'd like to extend my heartfelt gratitude for sparing some time off this morning to attend this event. As the platform is yet to be completely filled, kindly wait for other participants to arrive. While waiting, fellow participants may fill in the registration form, which is pinned in the comment section below. Good morning, everyone. And on behalf of the council, I'd like to extend my heartfelt gratitude for sparing some time off this morning to attend this event. As the platform is yet to be completely filled, please wait for the other participants to arrive. While waiting, fellow participants may fill in the registration form, which is pinned in the comment section below. Kindly note that the event will start in five minutes.
Assalamualaikum and a very good morning. Welcome to Intex Student Leaders Forum 2021 Mastering Online Learning. Before this event goes any further, allow me to introduce myself. I am Elhan Rusdin and I will be your moderator for today's event. In honor of this program, we are lucky enough to have with us four bright and well-achieved youth leaders to give their two cents into today's forum. Without further ado, let's meet our panelists for today. The first panelist is Mr. Hashil Is Hashmizar. He is from Intec Education College, and he is the president of the Intec Student Council. Currently, he is in the American Degree Transfer Program. Our second panelist is Ms. Mastura Anwar. She is from College Marabanting, or as you may call it, KMB. She is the Vice President of Majlis Perwakilan Pelajar MPP KMB. Currently, she is taking the International Baccalaureate. The third panelist of today is Mr. Jonathan Jeremiah Edward. He is from Taylor's University and he is the President of Taylor's University Student Council. Currently, he is in a degree in Accounting and Finance. The fourth panelist for today is Ms. Afika Mazlan. She is from College Mara Seremban and she is the Vice President of Majlis Perwakilan Pelajar KMS. Currently, she is undertaking A-levels. Our last but not least panelist today is Mr. Muhammad Amir Muhammad Tushnan. He is currently in Campus Sultan Haji Ahmad Shah. University Tenaga Nasional. He is the president of Campus Sultan Haji Ahmad Shah's Foundation Club. Currently, he is undertaking the foundations in accounting. Online learning is education that takes place over the internet. It is often referred to as e-learning among other terms. However, Online learning is just one type of distance learning, which is the umbrella term for any learning that takes place across the distance and not in a traditional classroom. As we move into the era of online learning, this new method creates problems for some of our people. Hence, today's forum is to unravel how online learning has created an impact on students today. Wait no longer. Let's hear what our bright panelists have to say in this first round of today's forum. The first panelist for today is Mr. Muhammad Hashril. And just a reminder for all the viewers for today, if they have any questions for the panelists, feel free to drop them down in the comments below. The first question for today that I would like to give Mr. Hashril is that the new normal in Malaysia has created a drastic shift in the learning environment of students. In your humble opinion, what is the effect of e-learning to the youth of our nation? Well, so for years, am I audible, sorry? Yes, you are. I can uh, hear you. So for years, we we have lived through our education system. For years, we have also seen the gap of opportunity that Malaysians from different backgrounds have to endure. But also for years, we have just became indifferent to the changes and inequalities of our education system. But I think that what's, what's good about COVID-19 is that when it hit Malaysia, all of these problems just become so much more apparent than it actually was. So to answer this question, how it affects the youth of our nation, I think it's, it's good for me to establish these three things. Number one, I'll explain to you the disparity of access that students across this nation have to face. Number two is the solutions that have been imposed by the state. And number three is how it generally affects the academic performance of our students. All right, so let's look at uh, the disparity of access of students. So. It should be clear to all of us that our education system has multiple facets of discrimination, multiple facets of inequality. This can be anything from 
uh, race, it can be gender, it can be geographic location and socioeconomic st status. But I think the highlight of the answer to this question is the socioeconomic statuses of our students. Why is this so? It's because when MCO hit Malaysia, when COVID hit Malaysia, we are introduced with a new system of learning. We are introduced with a new structure of learning that requires these three essential things to cope and to survive in this new system. Number one is you would have to have a device. This can be a tablet, this can be a PC, this can be a laptop. These three are most convenient, but you know, if you don't have those things, a smartphone will make do. Next, you would also need to have the ability to adapt to synchronous and asynchronous forms of classes. And number three, you would have to have at least a suitable and a decent environment for classes, right? So what are the problems that exist that inhibit the functionality of this new structure? Well, A, not everyone has access to stable internet nor devices. In fact, half of Sabahans uh, in Malaysia don't have access to internet at all because of the inadequate infrastructures. And not all have access to laptops or smartphones. And when we look at stories, that when we listen to stories that we've heard from um, students living in PPRs, uh, Project Perumahan Rakyats, we, we know now that most of them actually share a single device amongst their siblings. This basically looks like a mother working and she has a phone, but she has to sacrifice that phone to give to her children and let them learn. So what's equally as important to these devices is also an internet connection that is stable. You will need this to survive, right? But you cannot rely solely on prepaid. That just, that just will not work. It's not fast enough. It's not enough. You would need a stable internet connection. You would need a Wi-Fi or a broadband. And if I'm not mistaken, the cheapest broadband out there would cost around 89 ringgit, which is quite expensive. The next problem is that parents that are from these poor areas are oftentimes working blue collar jobs. And these individuals, these parents, are the ones that are most vulnerable to this pandemic. These are the ones that are struggling to, to even put food on the table. These are the ones that have the highest possibilities of being retrenched from their, from their jobs, of being retrenched um, from their bosses. And for you and for us to expect them to afford gadgets for their children is just, I just think it's a bit ridiculous. The next problem is that we assume that everyone has a suitable environment to learn. But to learn, you will need to have an environment where you don't have your dogs and cats, you know, walking around behind you. You cannot have your children, your, your siblings screaming and your parents asking you to do this and that. You would need a quiet environment that not all of us have. Not all of us have access to a home office or a room dedicated for learning. This applies even more to remote areas of Peninsula, Malaysia, like Sabah and Sarawak, where even access to the most basic of, re basic of resources are limited, where electricity is only limited to daytime or nighttime. All right. Well, that's those are the problems but let's just look at the solutions that the state has imposed well one clear solution is budget 2021 so what can we get from that well this march we're supposed each and every one of our students are supposed to get 180 students of telecommunication telecommunication credit which i think is good we would have free wi-fi at 130 pprs which is also good and we were promised to be given a hundred and fifty thousand laptops well given right but just like a lot of other promises i guess this, this is just another hoax as we don't know what are the updates right now and it seems like it's just turning out to be another loan scheme and we are also blessed with uh television-based learning which i also think is good so all of these things and these solutions are good but 
I don't think it's enough. I think that it is imperative for the budget to have included maximum funding for uh, the technological, uh, technological tools in our schools and our colleges and our universities. And I also think that there should have been direct spending to poverty-stricken areas to help them out of their situation, to help them survive with this new form of learning. And I also think that there should have been more allocation to universities and colleges and schools to equip a better and more and enhance the uh, teaching practices of uh, their teachers. So how this affects the academic performances of their students should just be plain clear. You know, students in urban areas have a clear advantage over their uh, over their poorer counterparts in rural areas. So the poor are just hampered in trying to cope with the bare minimum. So there's just no motivation there, and it's not their fault. And with that, they're just not able to execute their best. When the privileged are succeeding, the poor are just failing and falling behind. And I think that this is just unfair. And I think that this defeats the whole purpose of the education system, which is supposed to strive on achieving a narrower gap in education and achievement uh, attainment. Well, I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Hashril, for the enlightenment you gave today. Hopefully, viewers now have a wider view of the duality of this situation. Thank now, you. moving on to our second panelist of today, Ms. Mastura. Now, the question I have for you, Ms. Mastura, is that based on your experience in both online learning and face-to-face -face learning, could you share with us some comparison on how e-learning better benefits the students rather than it does in conventional learning? All right. Uh, thank you, Alhan. Um, I personally think this is quite an interesting question as most of us are very used to complaining about online learning, but it somehow forces me to find the advantages in it and i did quite uh, i did find quite a few of it and the first one would be that uh i'm considering the uh if i'm considering the fact that everyone has the same uh internet uh same level of internet connectivity in this because it's hard since we have other challenges as well right but in this case uh with in with online learning everyone in the class gets the same how do i say it the same learning experience because if we were in a lecture hall say uh some would be at the front some would be at the back and the back uh, and the ones sitting at the back would obviously get a disadvantage in uh, in terms of they don't get to see the view of the slide they'll be in the back maybe they don't even can't even hear what the lecturer is saying but when it's online, everyone is basically sitting in the front row of the lecture. And I, other than, being, uh, other than it being easier to screenshot things, we can also screen record the lectures ourselves. And it benefits us in terms of we can rewatch if we can cope, uh, we can cope with how the lecture, how fast the lecture is going. And for me, I consider myself as someone that's quite a slow, quite, <laughs> I understand things at my own pace. So it's quite beneficial for me, for me to be able to record the classes. Okay, uh, other than that, I realized that it also saves time, energy, and cost. Why? Because I understand that other colleges have to move in between classes, uh, like from one class to another, they have to move to another lecture hall, for example. But in KMB, we actually just stay in our classes and the lecturers come. However, we also have to spend time uh, if we have to go to the lab or to the library, for example. But when we're online, all we have to do is, do, at most, we just have to open another tab and click a new link. And that's pretty practical for me who I I find myself dreading having to move when learning. Yeah, okay. Uh, and I also said something about saving cost. This, this is in terms of for the lecturers. 
uh, in KMB also, we're very used, we're more like a school system, not much of a college or university system. And so we have our modules and stuff. But when it's online, our teachers all, always opt for sending the resources online. And this saves costs. At the same time, it also saves the environment a little bit in one way or another. Okay, uh, next. This is quite an important thing that I realized that this situation that we're in actually forces us students and educators themselves to, um, to find alternatives in learning. Um, one of my counselors actually once said that a community that fails to learn to adapt would soon or, sooner or later face extinction uh it's quite a stretch but it's it's actually really true um if you think about us now the with the pandemic happening and the learning being forced to move online we were practically forced to find other ways for us to learn normally somewhat normally yeah. and if for example uh, i gave google classroom Google Classroom were, wasn't really used. I, I was aware of the existence of it, but we didn't really utilize it until online school happened. And Google Classroom wasn't just invented. It was actually uh, invented back in 2014. And also video conferencing platforms such as Zoom, Webex, Microsoft Teams. It was uh, once the pandemic started, then uh, once the pandemic started, we actually started using it more. Like, like I, <laughs> I've never heard of Zoom before pre-quarantine, and I'm pretty sure most of us also think, uh, also didn't know about Zoom before. And I, when it comes to group works as well, like, um, me, I, I, I'm saying this uh, in my personal experience. I personally don't like doing our group work discussions via WhatsApp or Telegram because it doesn't hold the group members accountable enough. So what uh, my class decided to do was we established, a, we created a Discord server uh, for our class, which forces everyone to be in the Discord during group discussions. And that's um, my... That's like my suggestion for anyone out there who is facing problems with group discussions because it's really effective. And yeah, I think that's all from what I found. Um, oh, last one. I realized that being online, learning online, somehow trains us for life in general where we act, we will uh, we will actually be alone especially in university you know uh we uh back in high school i think we are used to um, we are used to relying to to be rely uh, to rely on the teachers uh but now that things are online i find that i can no longer do that i have to find things on my own find the resources on my own and I think that's quite a big life lesson for me. Okay, uh, that's all from, from me for this question. Thank you. What a great response, Ms. Mastura. Certainly an optimistic view on our current situation is imperative for a student's motivation. Moving on to our third panelist for today, Mr. Jonathan. The question I have for you today is, do you mind sharing with us how your institution implements the online learning system? Do you personally think that it is effective in improving the student's academic performance? Thank you so much, Ilhan, for the question. So as touching to what Mastura actually said earlier, I just want to say that online learning isn't a very new thing. It's not something new at all. It's just recently been amplified due to this whole pandemic situation. And it's very interesting to see because Taylor's University actually has something called e-learning week. And the thing is, we actually studied online for a whole week. And this has been going on for years and years. 
it technically is a day for us to kind of take rest and also um, explore the world online as Taylor wants us to be a more holistic or well-rounded student. But let's fast forward to right now and break down what we have right now. So Taylor provides us actually things like Zoom and Teams and all these rewinds as Mastura said earlier. And it's so interesting because these things are super, super important and they don't leave out other students like um, those mass comm students, they give them things like editing apps. Those students who go into uh, fields like medicine or anything, they have virtual laboratories, virtual um, assignments and stuff like that. And it's very interactive and lecturers actually like guide them through. It's very easy to see them um, like just guide everybody through, but when the lecturers actually had to shift from online offline to online it was very difficult for them to learn all these new things and i really um, commend them for all their effort so in teams and in zooms it is actually super good because they are able to teach tutorials online and everything is at their fingertips it's super easy and super adaptable but as what hasriel said earlier which is a very important point is that not everybody in malaysia actually has the same privileges as you and I, both of us right now, we are actually on this platform. We have a stable Wi-Fi connection. But the thing is that some people in Sabah, Sarawak, the outskirts, they don't have devices. They don't have a proper conducive study area. They don't have Wi-Fi. These things are very troubling. So going on to the next part of the question where we say, do I think it is effective? Yes and no. Simply because um malaysia currently as what hasriel also said earlier we are not there yet we have this whole budget 2021 which promises us uh, how many hundred fifty thousand laptops and stable wi-fi connection but i think we are a long way to go from that and just a year into this whole pandemic this whole online situation is going to take a lot of effort but let's put ourselves in a what if situation what if malaysia was already there what if Malaysia was already having the most stable Wi-Fi, everybody had a laptop, everybody was able to access information so easily and were very, very, um, how do I say this? Very, they were very um, experted in this whole uh, online field. I think that Malaysians would grow so well, they would be able to adapt to all these changes and learn so easily. This is um, very interesting to see because Malaysians, I. I can see it takes time for us to adapt because we are more sit back and more relaxed at times. But when I was shifting into this whole online situation, I was actually very excited because one, it was online learning. It was something new. And I think a lot of people are still, still struggling to actually get there in this whole online situation. Um, another thing that I want to touch about is actually lecturers and all these academics adapting to these changes because I feel that they were just shoved into this whole online learning thing, same as we were, and they are struggling as much as we are right now. So it isn't very effective, actually. However, the people in Taylor's University are doing an amazing job because they are going for courses day in, day out to improve our learning. And I see them implementing all these new things every single lesson. They introduce things like Padlet, where we get to share our expressions and makes classes more interesting. We also have like these very interactive polling sessions on Zoom. And to see lecturers of very senior age who are very wise in offline teaching, go into something online and learn these things. We, the youth of today, I think we can do so much better and we also can help them out. We can actually push forward and someday in the future, I think we will really get that. So to answer that question, I don't think it's as effective for now, but I think we are getting that. Step by step, day by day, we will surely get that. Yeah, I think that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jonathan. It is very appreciable to see that institutions in Malaysia have no problem catching up with educational development and are actively helping its other students in adapting to current situations. Moving on to our fourth panelist for today, Ms. Afika. Now, hello, Ms. Afika. 
um, given the opportunity to experience both online learning and face-to-face -face learning, what are the advantages and disadvantages of online learning that is prominent to your recent experience? Okay, thank you, Rohan. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Afika. So to answer that question, um, it's that based on your recent experiences, well, you're going to have to know my experience first for me to have to elaborate the strengths and weaknesses. So uh, based on my experience, um, I've actually been going to face-to-face -face classes ever since my first term in college, my term mine. So to say we've been going back and forth to class, meeting our lecturers face-to-face, -face, having group discussions with our classmates. We were living a normal life admits this whole pandemic but of course by abiding the SOP given out by the government but it, even after I said that um, we've only just recently uh, transferred to online learning I would say at the end of last year so the most experience that I had online learning is for about a month and a few weeks or so so based on that experience I would say that it was a very drastic change because to some students who um, started their classes straight away online, like meaning they've never even set foot in their campus or they've never really met their lecturers face to face, they may have already adapted and like it was easier for them to conduct their classes because they're used to having it online. But for me, for someone who was already comfortable with my regu uh, regular schedule of meeting my lecturers and going back and forth to class, it was quite a shock. I would say it was a culture shock for me to go online and have these disabilities, disadvantages that I just now realized all my friends were having. So um, let's go to the question. It says, what are the strengths and weaknesses? Um, Hashriel, Masura, and even Jonathan has already touched upon many of the weaknesses. Uh, first and foremost, of course, uh, the connection access, the accessibility to techno technology and laptops, phones, gadgets, Wi-Fi. Not everybody has the privilege to have these in hand for them. And even for me, who has internet, it's not always stable. Like even in the middle of class, you could suddenly be disconnected and you'd, you'd leave the Google Meet or you'd leave the class unexpectedly. And I think that is one of the biggest weaknesses. And then there's like, microphone problems and then camera problems like these little things that you wouldn't even have to think about if you went to face-to-face -to -face classes um the second weakness that i can see through online learning is the ability to sense understanding what i mean by that is that when a teacher is teaching through online classes they are only able to give out their knowledge they can't sense if their students are actually absorbing the knowledge or applying it in what they're learning because they can only see your faces through the screen. Whereas in class, they're able to like really see if you're doing the work, if you're actually paying attention, if you're distracted or if you're tired, it's very prominent face to face and you're able to detect that. But through online learning, through online classes, it's very hard for the lecturers to understand students' positions. And students, like I say, in online classes, not everyone turns on their camera, not everyone actually pays attention. That's a big disadvantage because we want the best of the both worlds. We want everyone to be able to understand what they're learning and we want them to fully um, utilize the time that they're spending online to gain the knowledge. But because of that restraint, the lectures are only able to give and that's the most after that, it's like the student's responsibility to really put their effort to actually understand what they're learning. The third weakness is that activities are ceased in sense that lab experiments cannot be conducted and like fun activities, experiments and like investigations that could have been done on hand face to face are all ceased and like everyone's just staying at home and it's quite tiring, which leads me to the fourth weakness, which is it has a total affect to our mental health and physical health because imagine waking up in the morning and having to sit in front of the laptop for i'd say eight hours straight for some people four hours for some people but people will have mental problems and physical problems in sense of you would get drained you're easily drained if you're learning from a laptop for so long if you're sitting in a chair for so long you'd have back pains and so on and so forth headaches um, eye problems you know many things that can cause 
problems to you. And then the fifth weakness, I think I would say, is that um, the student's integrity, it's the honesty in learning, is that um, even in face-to-face -face classes that you would never know how a student is honest in their exams or not, people will still find a way to cheat. I cannot deny that. But like online learning, online tests, online exams, it's easier for students to cheat and lie and just grab the answers off the internet. And it's really, it's really hard to like actually evaluate the student's understanding because of that. Um, I wanted to jump to the strength because I didn't want to dread on this negativity. Um, the strength in online learning that I've observed is that it's very flexible. So it, it suits the students who are able to control their time and able to manage their own schedule. And they don't have to rush about, like I say, I'd have to wake up so early in the morning just to get ready to walk to class and then walk back to class. It's time consuming, but since online learning is like you just have to open your laptop, it's very flexible and you're able to like manage your own time by yourself without having the pressure of coming late to class. And then there's the comfort of online learning where you are able to sit in the comforts of your room or in the comforts of your own classroom or your living room, whatever. You are very comfortable in the sense that you have control over where you want to study. You could study outside, for goodness sake. You could study in the library or wherever you want, and no one would judge you for that. This uh, third strength is that it's easy to, like Mastura said, to like screen record the lectures and look back on the things that you've learned. It's easy to gain knowledge on the internet. It's easy to gain like tutorials and textbooks and much more through internet access. Uh, I don't have enough, enough time, but I'd like to say the other strength is that online learning really does prepare you to be more independent in your learning. You are more aware of your capabilities and you'd be more aware of the time that you have to spend to really understand something without the help of people around you. So I guess that's the strengths and weaknesses that I could say for now. Thank you. Thank you for that answer, Miss Afika. Your experience certainly shined a light on how there are great things in even the worst things. <laughs> Moving on to our last but not least, panelists for today, Mr. Amir. Now, the question I have for you today is that one of the drawbacks of online classes is the lack of in-person interaction. How does this lack of in-person interaction with both classmates and lecturers affect the academic productivity of students? What can the students do to best cope with the situation? All right, thank you so much, Elhan. So um, based on this question, whereby it's asking me lack of in-person interaction with both classmates and lecturers affect the academic, the academic productivity of students. So from my point of view, um, as a student in University of Tanaga National, when I first entered, I was given the chance to experience face-to-face -face learning because I'm doing accounting. So. Um, during this college life, which is about eight months, I have seen how is it during face-to-face -face learning and how is it during uh, virtual learning. So during face-to-face -face learning, I can't deny that there are interactions with the lecturers and with our classmates because we see them in class. We communicate with them when we have um, discussions, group studies. But then now that all of us are at home and we have got and we are now into online learning, so it is more of a one-way communication. So how does this affect our academic productivity as a student? All right. So from my point of view, the firstly is the vibes. So for us, uh, when we are in class, we have that vibe whereby we uh, said that we are going to study that we are going to learn something new, a new topic today. So, and we have our friends to support us by our side and we have our lecturer watching us. So we have a two-way communication. Our lecturer is speaking with us and we are speaking with our lecturer. If we don't understand a question, we may straightforwardly ask our lecturer and they may ask us back. So you see, 
the communication between the lecturer and the student is there. And when we have our classmates with us, it is much more better for us to interact because um, when we don't understand a certain topic and we don't feel like asking our lecturer about it, we can discuss with our friends. So I feel that face-to-face um, -face learning, there is definitely interaction with the lecturer and the student. But then now when it comes to online learning, um, um, from University of Tanaga National, usually when we have our online learning, we do it through Microsoft Teams, Zoom, and Google Meet. And most of the time, the lecturers are the ones explaining to us about the topic or about the question that we will be doing on that certain day. So um, I can definitely say that it is more to a one-way communication because um, it is tough for the students to actually express how they feel about the topic and for them to ask a question because, you know, when we have our online classes, maybe some of us are shy to ask or maybe we do have internet problems. Like um, as uh, particip participant uh, panelist A said whereby um, some of us do not have the infrastructure or the privilege to um, utilize this online learning at its fullest. So um, these are the drawbacks that we will face during online learning. So when we don't have that interaction with our lecturer or with our classmates, it will be tough for us to academically uh, do well in our studies. So that will be my first point. Secondly, will be our level of understanding. So level of understanding is um, when, okay, all of us have experienced um, sitting down in a classroom and listening to our lecturer or maybe during our form five, we listened to our teacher explaining to us. So we know how is it when we go to school or when we go to classes, we see how the lecturer explains to us or when our teacher explains to us, we tend to be more focused to what the lecturer is explaining to us. Whereas when we are during online learning, during online learning, we have got these distractions beside us whereby we are using our laptop for our e-learning. And on our laptop, there are multiples of distractions such as YouTube, Netflix. So if you do not discipline yourself to make sure that you focus in class and then it will be tough for you to actually understand what your lecturer is going to say. So the tendency for you to not do well in your exams or maybe uh, not understand that topic is a bit tough. And last but not least would be the efficiency. So efficiency, um, I would like to strongly agree that in-person interaction is much more important and much more efficient compared to e-learning because it is all rounded and we have been going through that daily in our everyday lives and now we are now in this online learning i'm not saying that we are not capable of um, participating in this e-learning it's just that because it's a new norm in our situation so it is a new thing that we have got to try to adapt so it is still in the adaptation process so of course studying um, ver uh, face to face is much more better because we have our teachers and friends right beside us, especially if you are in a boarding school. We have got uh, multiple sources to go to or we can have group studies. So it is much more of an effective environmental way to study compared to being at home. So now here comes the question on how do we cope um, with this situation? How do we as students best cope with this situation? So from my point of view, as students, um, we can't use this lack in-person interaction to affect our academic productivity as a student. It doesn't mean that when we enter this e-learning, we have the excuse to deteriorate in our studies because um, we have got, we need to find new ways. Whenever there is a problem, there is always a solution. So firstly, um, how do we students best cope with this is because nowadays we have YouTube. So if you don't understand a certain topic or you feel that how your lecturer explained it to you through e-learning is not that efficient. You can watch YouTube videos whereby what your lecturer explained in maybe two hours is there on YouTube for maybe half an hour. So, and you can repeatedly watch it if you didn't record your lecture during the day. So when you watch that, you have got a different source for you to understand 
what is being un, uh, what is being taught by a lecturer in class. So, um, so it definitely helps you to understand the topic even more better. That is for me. Whenever I don't understand a certain topic, I will definitely go to YouTube and just you know search around on how on other explanations of how people explain about that topic and. And there is an, a tendency for me to understand that topic much more better. Because for me to ask my lecturers or for me to ask my friends, everyone is now busy during this e-learning because everyone has got their own job scope to do. So it is a bit tough to ask around. But then as a student, we need to have this initiative to find and, to find and research on yourself on how do we um, understand something even more better so that we can academically do well in our studies. And secondly would be um, secondly would be to ask our lecturer about it. Okay, so now comes the point whereby if you don't understand what is being taught in the YouTube or maybe you don't have that thought of searching on your own, the best thing to do is to ask your lecturer, meaning like maybe schedule an extra class or ask through WhatsApp, you know, uh, make the best out of everything. We can't always make this... Uh, bring us down. We can't just think, oh, because it is uh, e-learning and because I don't understand the topic and because um, my lecturer doesn't explain it to me well during the e-learning, I don't have to do well. No, we can't say that. We can't say that because we as human beings, we need to keep on evolving with what is happening around us, with the technological era that is happening right now. So if we were to keep on staying behind and keep on accepting that we need to have like uh, we need to have in person interaction with our classmates and students uh, classmates and lecturers then we will be bound to face difficulties in the future because we are not following the revolution that we are facing right now so yeah i hope that um, answers your question elmi elhan thank you thank you mr amir Thank you, Mr. Amir. A very informative insight from our last panelists for this round. I am positive our audience's perspective is greatly broadened. Very well. Such wonderful sharing given by our panelists today. We can't thank you enough for the informative talk. Now, how about we move on to our second round, shall we? Moving to our moving back to our first panelists of today. We have Mr. Hashril. Now, Mr. Hashril, I have a question for you. The question is, studies reveal that more than half of Malaysians have experienced mental health issues throughout this pandemic. In your opinion, how has e-learning affected the mental health of students and what measures should be taken to curb this issue? Okay, before I answer this question, I think it's important for me to just tell you that I have a trigger warning. I am going to talk about suicide, self-harm, and also abuse. Well, to answer this question, we have to understand that um, in this phase of our lives, uh, in this pandemic, we are alone at home. We are studying alone. And us being social animals, you know, having to be socially isolated and social distance and all of these things i don't that it just doesn't intertwine you know it just doesn't go well well i think it's important for me to say to explain to you these two things on how um, this new form of learning has affected our mental health number one is i'll talk about the new normal and you know its implications and number two i'll just talk about uh, briefly about how we as individuals, we can curb this issue together. So number one, let's just look at the new normal, right? The new norm. From an academic perspective, we have been studying with our peers, with our friends since our kindergarten, since our tadika days. And now we're you know, alone in our rooms, uh, being fully independent. Uh, it's, just, it's just a bit shocking to a lot of us, I think. And we also have our schedules and routines disrupted because I'll be honest with you, my peers have a lot of influence on my study schedules. Like in, in, uh, in my school, uh, a few years ago, a year ago, two years ago, I used to depend on my friends on uh, like assignments, like 
if I'm slacking off, they will be the ones to remind me and things of that sort. Also, we have sporadical and unclear updates on whether students should go to college or stay at home. Like last year, we were all forced to evacuate our colleges and universities and to continue studying at home. But now, we're, we're forced to go back to university and start uh, studying in university. So it, it's a lot of information. It's a lot of information that is unclear that even to this day, I am personally not sure which students are allowed to go back to my university and which are not. I mean, as you can see right now, I'm still at home. From a social standpoint, there is also an overwhelming mass of information that a lot of us have to process. One of them is the irregular MCO schedules and just, just the idea that we don't know when exactly this whole pandemic, this whole phase is gonna finish. And we also have been fed with the idea that you know mortality rates are constantly on the hike, infection rate is constantly on the hike. And then when we think that the only solution that we have is the vaccines, are the vaccines, Suddenly, all these aunties and uncles are spreading out these hoaxes about, you know, these vaccines are actually bad for us. You know, they can have harmful implications on our health and whatnot. So it just leaves us very, very confused, especially to our elderly relatives, right? And in addition to that, we are also living in a darurat. I'm not sure whether all of you know that, but yes, we are in darurat right now. And... A lot of us are not exactly sure what this darurat is, and it's just a lot of things to process. So all of this information is just bound to make us feel a level of anxiousness. It just, it just makes us feel a loss of control, and you know we're, we're just going to feel mentally fatigued. So it's not our fault. And also we have these vulnerable communities. We have the elderly, we have people with pre-existing mental health conditions. People with pre-existing mental health conditions, you know, when they are faced with situations that are not normal to them, like this one, the rate of arousal of their pre-existing conditions are just bound to spike up. As we can see, you know, throughout this MCO, the depression and also suicidal rates, rates have spiked throughout uh, the beginning of, uh, from the beginning of um, this whole phase. And also we have victims of domestic violence. We have those that actually live with their aggressors. And these are mainly women and children. And it's just really, really bad for their mental health. You know, a study by the STAR stated that almost 70% of adolescents and children are, uh, say that their parents are uh, punishing them physically and using verbal aggression and Recently, this year, Zubaydi Ami was killed by his parents at home. So all of these things are just a plain example of how it's you know, bad for the mental health of a lot of us. But to curb with this problem, I think that there are a few things that we can do. So here's the list. Number one, we can pick up new hobbies. You know, Hobbies won't hurt. Hobbies uh, make us fill our time with things that we enjoy. And to those that have access, I think it's also important that we digitally connect with our relatives, digitally connect with our friends, go on a Skype, go on a Zoom call with them. You know, this provides us with a sense of emotional comfort and also security. Third is we could also, uh, sorry, a personal advice that I like to give my friends who come to me when they are anxious and confused is, you know, sometimes you just have to sit back, tenang, and just comprehend the situation. And most of the times, it's a lot worse in our heads than it actually is, you know, the situation. Fourth is you don't need to feel bad for Netflix and chilling. I, I mean that literally, like Netflix, watching Netflix, not figuratively. Uh, fifth is you also, you also have to understand what is within your control and what is not within your control. You don't have to think about, you know, how worse things can get. You just follow what we have been instructed to do. You, know, you wash your hands, you social distance, you stay at home, and just understand that you are also doing the best that you can do. You're doing your part to help everyone around you. And sixth is you need to practice altruism. 
Now, out of all times, is the most crucial time for all of us to care for people. Now is the time for us to reach out to people that we once have forgotten. Now is the uh, time for us to reach out to the people that we love, uh, our friends, our neighbors, anyone. Because sometimes even the slightest of uh, thought, like just saying, how are you? Hi, how are you? Is, would be very, very great for a person. Seventh is, it's also important for us to practice a healthy lifestyle. This means that we should sleep well, we should um, eat well, we should rest well, we should exercise. And to those of you that need medication, it's also important to take your medication. Eighth is only consume news from credible, credible sources. This can be any news portal, but what is not reliable is news from all of these WhatsApp groups, especially the ones that involve your uh, elderly relatives, the one I don't know where they get the information from, but it's just interesting. Lah. But don't rely on that news. It just leaves us a bit confused and it just fusses our minds. Ninth is you have to love yourself. That means in the process of you caring for uh, these your neighbors and your friends and the people that you love, you also have to think about yourself. You also have to take care of yourself you also have to protect and love yourself. And lastly, for those that need help, please, please, please don't be shy to seek for help. We have the Women's AIDS Organization, WAO, for those that have experienced, that are experiencing or have experienced domestic violence. We have Befrienders, we have Talian Kase, we have the MMHA, which is the Malaysian Mental Health Association, and a lot more that we will share on our Instagram page that you can contact if you need help. And to make you feel better, last year, throughout last year, from the beginning of MCO, uh, the Ministry of Health has received 43,000 calls via its psychological support hotline. So you're not the only ones uh, that are experiencing these things. Others are also experiencing uh, these things. So don't be shy. You know, the best thing that you can do is just give a call and ask for help, and you would do yourself a huge, huge favor. I hope that answers your question, Ilhan. Thank you for the insightful take on students' mental health, Mr. Hashil. Certainly, it's important to take in the fact that mental health is as important as bodily health. Moving to our second panelist for today, Ms. Mastura. Now, the question that I have for Ms. Mastura is, on the 1st of July 2020, the NST addressed the issue of how students find it hard to stay motivated in online learning. How far can you students relate to this situation? And in your defense, what causes these difficulties to happen? All right, thank you, Han, for the question. Um, okay, so I was actually encouraged to answer the questions based on personal experience. So I'll start with uh, telling everyone a story. <laughs> it's not a story, it's just a true experience. Um, back when my team got the news that our whole second semester, my batch, our whole second semester will be held online, we were all personally very worried because Prior, even prior to the announcement, uh, a lot of our friends came up to us saying that they couldn't take uh, online learning anymore. But once uh, the administrators uh, told us uh, this decision was not negotiable, we had to give the news one way or another. And the, the, the decision was actually made because we had to prioritize uh, the second year students' health and safety since they were taking, they will be taking their final exams uh, this upcoming May. And we all understood that and it, it is important for them, you know. And right after, I would say right after we posted the announcement, my personal messages were flooded with my friends telling me that that they really can't do it anymore and when i i couldn't 
I couldn't express how I really felt. I felt really bad. But at the same time, personally, I was also feeling down because I was somehow expecting that maybe we had a chance to go back to uh, go back to college this semester. And so if to answer the first question that how far can we relate, I would say uh, my the students, uh, KMB students could really relate to it. And I will also mention the fact that um, in KMB, uh, we all, my my batch, we all take uh, the International Baccalaureate Program, which is, uh, we which we call as IB. And IB, uh, I, other people, uh, other programs are of course have their, uh, of course have their own, you know, uh, disadvantages and difficulties. But I would say that we really face a very hard time since um, this second semester, a lot of our projects, which we call internal assessments, uh, already are on the starting process. Um, this this uh, IA, we call internal assessments as IA, is very important actually for our final IB exam marks. And you know how when we are first introduced to something, a new concept, it's very hard for it was very hard for us to understand what we had to do. And being online didn't really help with it. A lot of us were confused. Of course, we had talks, we had uh, the lecturers to help us, but being online did not make it easier, you know. Um, uh, this is for like the defense on why we why it was hard for us. Um, when we're confused and plus with the fact that we're online, we're alone at home, being confused alone is not a good combination. You're confused and you're alone. And I guess that's the, how do you say it? That's the cons to being uh, at home, you know? And there's actually a saying that a trouble shared is a trouble half meaning being on campus will actually make us feel like we're on the same boat. Our whole batch, we're all struggling, we're all trying to find our place. But instead, being alone at home somehow gives me and uh, my friends the illusion as if like we're the only ones struggling. Everyone around else is okay, but I'm alone in this. I guess that's why um, it's very hard to be motivated when we're at home, you know, we feel lost, we feel like, why am I the only one feeling like this? And not to mention when we're at home, several of my friends actually have to tend to other responsibilities, such as taking care of their other siblings, um, fetching their siblings from school, making sure they eat, and doing house chores. Um, it somehow it somehow makes that when we're at home, we're not only uh, carrying the burden of being a student, but we're also carrying the burden of taking care of the household in a way, being a good family member, being a good child. It's, and I would say that it's not easy for us. You know, um, being students is already hard enough, I would say, but having to take care of the family of course, it would be another burden, and also uh, a lot. Uh, we also uh, already discussed about the disadvantages of online learning, like internet in internet connectivity, and all those disadvantages that we discussed before. Those also contribute to the lack of motivation that students have to face. But again, like Hashra said. Um, the only choice that we have now is for us to be at, at our most optimistic self. I personally had a hard time for around like four months, I would say, trying to adapt to online learning. But once I accepted, once I tried to find the bright side of online learning, it instantly became better. It, it's not like 180 degrees uh, better, but it did become better. I stopped um crying alone <laughs> okay no no sad sorry uh i stopped you know i could actually start learning normally and i would also thank the um no no okay so uh i would say as a conclusion that this question 
uh, we, uh, my friends at KMB, and including me, could really relate to it. And but we're trying our best to, you know, overcome it. I guess. Uh, that's all from me. Right. Thank you, Ms. Mastura. It's interesting to see how others unravel the root of their problems to its very core. Hopefully, our audiences could learn a thing or two from your experiences. Thank you, Ahead. <laughs> now, moving on to our third panelist for this round, Mr. Amir. Now, Mr. Amir, um, the question I have for you today is, why do online-based students need good time management and what does it take for a student to have good time management? All right, thank you, Ilhan. So now comes the question of why do we need good time management? So basically, as Mastura said just now, that when we are at home, we have got our responsibilities at home that we have our parents at home and our siblings and all of that. So um, we tend to be distracted or we tend to have more responsibilities to do compared to when we are at campus. Because when we are at campus, it is either we are focusing on ourselves, we'll be learning, studying, um, having study groups and all of that. But then when we are at home, it's a totally different environment whereby um, you need to help your mom like suddenly your mom will call you to do chores or your dad calls you to do something or you need to take care of your sibling feed the cat or dog so basically you've got multiple responsibilities at home so how do we as students tackle this um this issue so that we can be both um good in our studies as well we can take up the responsibility as um, a family member at home as well as a student of a college so basically that is why we need to have good time management whereby we know when do we do something and uh, we know how to differentiate which is more important so that is why we need to have good time management secondly is that um, at home we have got two responsibilities whereby um, first uh, what I mean by two responsibilities is that we have got two types of families. Firstly, we have got um, those friends whereby their family are more um, introverts, whereby they spend time on their own. And so they have got more time to study and they have more time to focus academically so that they don't have to be distracted by their family. But then there are families whereby they prioritize family time. I'm not saying that that is a bad thing, but then too much of that will make you un be unable to um, focus academically on your studies. So um, that is why you need to know how to differentiate your time, how to, how to make sure that things are moving smoothly so that it won't be a burden for you because um, there will be one point, uh, there will come, come one point whereby you feel that you can't um, cope up with it anymore because it is too tough because you feel that you are juggling too much in your hand that you just can't go forward with it. And that is when you break down and it will be tough for you to, uh, how do I say this, uh, do well in your academics. So, of course, it is important to have good time management. And what does it take for a student to have good time management? So now it goes back to our basic roots where we used to hear during our primary school and our secondary school, the first thing will be discipline. So... I'm not going to give a lecture here about discipline, but then that is, of course, the most essential thing that we need to think of when it comes to good time management. This is because, um, because when you have discipline, um, you tend to understand or uh, you tend to focus yourself on doing something particularly. And when it comes to discipline, it, what I mean by discipline is by having your own schedule. So uh, basically like jadwal belajar. So or jadwal harian. So you have your, in the morning, what time you wake up and then uh, your classes. And you share that with your family so that um, your family knows that you have got um, this this time you have class or you have midterm examinations. You know, sometimes uh, a week before you have exams and you are really focused on studying and you need to focus and then suddenly comes your mother calling you to do something and all that. It's not a bad thing, but then 
it uh, distracts you so you won't have time to study you know speaking from experience so like if we are at campus uh, it's totally different because we have got no distractions and we can focus on studying and all of that so when you have your schedule and you share it with your parents and you say that uh, mom and dad this time i need to study and all that so it is already planned out for your day and no one can say anything to it because you will be following that schedule. So discipline is important. You need to follow what you state in there. You can't be saying that you have got class at this time and you've got an exam at this day, but then uh, you're playing games at the back. Yeah, so that's my point of view. And when you have your schedule, it doesn't mean that you need to be totally focused on studies or having family time. You need to have time for yourself as well because online learning is stressful. I can't deny that. People can't be saying that online stressful is an easy thing because uh, you just open your laptop in the morning and then you just have to listen to your lecturer. It's not as easy as that. It's not as easy as how it sounds like. Because um, um, the reason why they say it's easy, because when we go to campus, when we are at campus, we need to dress up. We need to uh, wear something nice, wake up early in the morning, get ready, go to our classes and all of that. So um, it is much more different than how we are on e-learning. But then in e-learning, it is also important because we need to focus in class. So having... Um, enough sleep is important and having your own self time and doing self time as what Hashwell said just now is that uh, watching Netflix is not a problem because um, some people find that is how they release their stress and maybe sometimes you play games and you know so you can include that in your daily schedule so that is my first point of how do we have good time management and secondly is having a checklist. So basically, um, you need to have like this, um, this is what I do, whereby I have these sticky notes around me, whereby whenever I settle a certain topic or whenever um, I settle a certain assignment, I'll check it off. So um, this shows that um, I know when do I settle off my, which is more important, which one do I have to prioritize first, meaning right beside there, I'll write down the due date for my assignments. Like now, we have got so many assignments for each subject. Like now in University of Tanaga National, I, during my second semester, I have eight subjects right now. And there are a lot of assignments, a lot of quizzes and midterms, which I'm sure they are, are all of you who are watching and my other fellow panelists are facing as well. So how do we tackle this? How do we uh, make sure that we finish everything on time and that we are able to do everything correctly finishing in finishing it on time is one thing but then to finish it correctly is also another thing so when you have everything planned in order whereby okay maybe this week i need to finish off this assignment so you know which how much time spent do you need to complete it and it'll be much more easier and much more efficient for you to settle everything in time so yeah that is why we as students we need to have um, good time management so that we can excel both as a student as well as at home we have got time for our family i hope that answers your question ilhan thank you so much thank you mr amir a great advice for our audience today now moving on to our fourth panelist today for this round miss afika now miss afika one of the biggest challenges for students in e-learning is to maintain discipline while being in the midst of learning in the comfort of their home. What mm -hmm. does self-discipline mean to you and how can it be further nurtured by the students? All right, this question is quite a tough one because it's very personal as in it asks what is self-discipline to me. So um, I need everyone to just open your minds and like relax. I think this forum has become way too professional and like serious so, so i need people to just take a deep breath and just listen and laugh along the way if i stumble among my words because i'm quite nervous too so okay what does self-discipline mean to me so um honestly self-discipline doesn't come from a place where like oh i was forced to do this i was forced to do that so to me self-discipline actually comes from self-respect so you might be wondering what does self-respect have to do with self-discipline okay when you wake up in the morning, you choose to wake up and you choose to get yourself ready and you choose to open your laptop and join your online class. That is your choice and you must respect that. Once you respect yourself and you respect your choice, then you know for a fact that you have intentions and your intention to join that class is to gain knowledge. So as a student, you must know that your intentions is to gain the knowledge and 
when you have that decision, you make the decision to join that class, you're going to have to do it all out. You know uh, that Malay saying, alang-alang menyuruh bekasam, biar sampai ke pengalingan. Just, if you do something, don't do it half-heartedly. Do it with all your might. Do it with pure intentions and with a goal, with a set target. Once you have that, you have something that you want to do and you expect outcome from it, then inshallah, like discipline comes along with it. So once you respect your decisions, you respect yourself, it just comes naturally that self-discipline. You would be more like, okay, I want this to happen. So what am I going to do to ensure that thing happens? And with self-discipline, with self-respect, comes respect for other people too. In this sense, online learning, when we're learning, it takes, it's more than just a one thing, a one person thing. You have your lecturers, you also have your classmates, you have people from other institutes sometimes that join your class. So that thing, it, it doesn't, it's not, it takes two to tango anymore, it takes more to tango, you know what I'm trying to say? So like, you respect those people. Once you respect those people, you respect your lecturers, you know that, your lecturer is having a hard time trying to conduct these online classes, especially for like older generation lecturers because they're used to face to face and like technology, uh, but technology for them isn't the easiest thing. Maybe for us because like we're used to this, we're used to using our laptops, using the internet, navigating, navigating our way through like, you know, these things, these laptops, these phones, it's easy for us, but we have to understand that other people are learning how to do these things too so once we respect that we will understand and we will be more cautious of the things that we do in class in online class so let's say in class self-discipline comes from when you turn on your cameras you know how lecturers be like oh can some people turn on their cameras uh, i'd like it i they'd love it if people answer their questions and like participate in the discussion because once you do that, you're showing that you respect them and also you respect yourself because you're doing it for yourself. At the end of the day, when you join classes, when you're learning, you're doing it for your own benefit. You're doing it for your knowledge, for your future. So again, it's, it just comes down to self-respect and self-discipline just comes along the way. So unlike Amir said before this about time management, discipline comes along with that too. So like once you have that, in mind it's all in the mindset actually if you have a positive mindset and you have a goal that you want to reach then it's not impossible to reach that um, let's say you want to do something tomorrow you'd plan it out planning is the first step to um to getting to where you want to be it, uh, the question says how can it be further nurtured by students okay the self-discipline it starts by planning so what i mean by planning is like what i may suggest it was have a timetable like you stick to a gradual schedule that you've made for yourself for the entire week or sometimes you don't even need that sometimes you would like say something in your instagram story or in your snap or in your status you tweet things like oh i'm gonna do this tomorrow or i'm gonna get three a stars that's it then that is also a, a, a form of planning a form of affirmation that like you're gonna do that so to do that, you're gonna have to do other things. So it's the little thing that matters along the way. And so once you get that down, once you have that planning, you see quite a straight line. You see a path. You finally see like what you're trying to gain from it. One thing that you need to know about self-discipline and online learning is that you need to know why. Why are you doing this? You need to know your intentions. Like I said, the root of everything is niat. So once you have the correct niyat, inshallah, it's, it just comes easily to you. So with the pure intentions of gaining knowledge, of trying to gain the proper things that you need to gain for your future, then it just comes naturally, honestly. It's not easy. It's not easy. I, I can admit that it's not easy because it's tiring. Online classes aren't the best things. But to further nurture that self-discipline in yourself is by taking care of yourself first. So everything I said between self-discipline, self-respect, and all that, it comes down to self-love. <laughs> Suddenly it's about love. It's about yourself. It's honest and everything just comes from yourself. If you know how to take care of yourself and you prioritize yourself, you'd respect yourself and you would take care of yourself. So take care of your health, take care of your mental health, do things that you need to do to show that 
you're okay. Like if you're feeling down, okay, go ahead. Like they said, watch Netflix or do some sports, do some yoga, do something that you can do amidst this pandemic. Pick up a new hobby, start knitting or play the guitar, do something for yourself. Remember that before you are a student, remember that you are human. So everyone has their flaws, everyone has feelings. So you must understand that you must take care of yourself first in order for you to succeed in life. So love yourself take care of yourself, do things that you need to do, and then remember your responsibilities as a student and why you are joining that class and why, why are you in an online class in the first place. So yeah, literally when you understand those fundamentals, self-discipline comes by itself. I don't want to give you the cliche answers like I'll do a schedule and like tick things off, yada, yada. I think everyone has heard of that before, but before you could achieve doing that, you need to have that self-respect and self-love for yourself to be able to have the drive to actually want to do those things. So I guess that's my answer. I guess that's, that's what self-discipline is to me. <laughs> yeah. That's all. <laughs> Thank you for your thoughts, Miss Afika. It's certainly very appreciable for all our audience today. All right, thank you, Lahan. Moving on to our last panelist today, Mr. Jonathan. Hello, Mr. Jonathan. All right, now, yeah. <laughs> the question that I'm about to give you is, do you agree that self-discipline time management and motivation are the key factors for an effective online learning. If so, considering the importance of those three, to what extent can they contribute to the overall achievement of a student? Thank you so much for the question, Elhan. So I think the previous panelists really highlighted self-discipline, time management, motivation, and apart from all that, they also did talk about self-love, and that's really cool. Um, but let me dive a little deeper on why it is actually effective for e-learning. The thing is, this question is a little tricky because everyone is built differently. Everyone's version of self-discipline, time management, and constant motivation varies so differently. And I don't think I'll be able to give like a fixed answer, but I'll give an overarching kind of answer to this. So basically, um, when we look into things like self-discipline, people who are in online classes are actually vulnerable to so many things. And it's bad because they are up to mischief. They are not focusing during class and it's not supposed to be that way. Some of the things that actually um, trouble the students this time around is actually things like online distractions. As what our panelists said earlier, Netflix, they are on your laptop and on your laptop, aside from your class that's going on, is Netflix and they are on that platform. That is a major online distraction. And I think that with self-discipline, you're able to eliminate this entirely because you're focused in class and you are pushing Netflix aside. But self-discipline, you also need it for offline things. For example, you're in your room. It's not a conducive study area. Maybe you have um, your brother or your little sister or maybe you even have like your PlayStation or something that keeps you company during your times of like de-stressing. And you seem to actually go for this thing instead of studying. With self-discipline, you're able to take that out of the equation as well. Another major factor I think is that students actually look at online learning as, oh, er okay, everything is already saved online and I can maybe do it later. That's procrastination. And I think procrastination is really bad because they don't have self-discipline and they just push things and things start to pile up and pile up and pile up. And then at the end of the day, this leads to my final um, part, which is motivation. But I'll get to that later. It piles up and it builds up to so much of stress and you just lose it. So with self-discipline, again, you're able to ignore and push that aside. Lastly, connected a little bit to my previous point on procrastination, students very frequently underestimate online learning. They believe that traditional means were more difficult to actually go there because they had to go to class, they had to write notes, they had to print their lecture notes, many things. 
But online learning, I can pause. I can play whenever I want. And not having that restriction to yourself, not having that ability to stop yourself from doing that, that is very difficult to actually carry on in university life or even college life. I feel like self-discipline is super, super important. Moving on to my next point on time management. So I think time management is covered earlier. Time management is where there's a balance between your work life and your um, whole family and relationships and so on. But coming into this online learning, I myself see no distinction in my life. I'm in my room, which is I'm at home, meaning I can do work and I can have family time at the same time. And there's no barriers to this and there's no set timing for this. So with time management, you're actually able to plan out your day. You're able to wake up early and you know set goals for your day. Because that way, you'd be able to distinguish the time where work and play and family time and everything in between. Moving on to the last part, which is motivation. So motivation is actually the trickiest, uh, most effective um, part of this whole question. Because motivation, people have different motivations. Some people it's money, some people it's love, some people it's just getting that good grade. But honestly, I think motivation in this time of online learning is actually the support, the care, the love from all your lecturers, your family members, and everyone. Because it's a difficult time. I'm not going to lie. Even for myself, going through online learning is super, super difficult. And we aren't able to actually meet people. And that just troubles people. People just feel like, I can't meet anybody. I can't, I'm not in uni. My uni life is gone. Stuff like that. But adding the equation, adding to the equation motivation, it really spices things up and people actually want to learn online. People actually want to push themselves and go above and beyond to improve themselves. But coming back, I think um, our panelists spoke about mental health earlier. And this really ties into mental health as well because people's mental health is just going really down. you know. And I think with proper motivation, this actually ties into mental health. And we are actually able to manifest this positivity and actually share it out with our fellow classmates, maybe even your lecturer and so on. And just to wrap it all up, these three things aren't the only things that actually help in online learning. I think there are so much more and every individual is actually very different. I think they just need to find out how and what it is to actually push them to have a better and effective online learning. Yeah, I think that's all for me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Amir. Another great thank you, Mr. Jonathan. Another great <laughs> another great take on our current issues today. Now, we will be having a break for five minutes and during that time, do enjoy the slideshow. The audience may use this five minutes break to ask away any questions by simply writing them down in the comment section below or asking them in the Instagram of Intex ISC page.
Hello everyone and welcome back. Did you have a good break? Because without delay, we will be moving on to our next agenda, which is the Q&A session. The first question will be from The first question will be from Siti Aisha Azhar. What are your suggestions for the online learning if the student is a type that needs to depend on others during the class lecture to ask questions? So I'll be passing the floor to any panelists who want to answer. I guess I can answer that because I feel like I can relate to that most because I am a student that needs to depend on others during class and needs to ask questions constantly. Um, what I do personally is that in class, I'm not shy or even if I was shy, I, I think that there's no time to be shy in class. If a lecturer is teaching, you don't understand, you must have the courage to raise your hand, like raise your hand and ask the lecturer, excuse me, ma'am, I'm so sorry, but can you repeat that? or ask for the lecturer to repeat. Even if she repeats it, he repeats it, and you can't understand, that's when you start to go to your WhatsApp, to your Telegram, and then you go to your friends, and you either make a video chat on the side, or after class ends, you have to find the time to get a group discussion through uh, webcams or those kind of things. But to me, um, if you were given the choice to stay in campus or go back home, I was given the choice to stay in campus or go back home. And so I did. I stayed in campus because I knew for a fact that if I go back home, I'd be distracted and I don't think I'd be able to learn. So that's the choice I made. But I was given the choice. Some people weren't given the choice. So the options that you have, I can suggest is to have like Mastu, what, what Mastura did with her classmates is to do a Discord and do group chats, uh, have tutors or mentor mentees, those kind of things that would really be effective if you guys truly knew who in your class or whoever it is who has already mastered that subject. In a sense, they are able to guide you. Don't seek guide, guidance from someone who is also not really sure of what they're teaching. You don't want to be on the track of a giant society. You know what I'm saying? Like you need to get the right knowledge. And if your lecturers can't give that to you, only then you go to your classmates, go to maybe your seniors, those kind of things. So my suggestion is that you do have the initiative to create these groups, create these sessions with these people and voice out your opinion because if you stay quiet, you would definitely not get what you intend to have. So that's my suggestion for this kind of situation. Thank you. Yeah, okay, maybe I can add on also to this question. I think it's super interesting how uh, Afika said, spoke my mind a little when she said that you mustn't stay quiet. I think this is so, so crucial because on your first day of class, you really have to get out there. You really have to make yourself known to everybody because the first thing that you have to know is that people have to know who you are in class because if you drop them a random WhatsApp, asking them random questions, they're going to be like, um, do, do I know you? Or, you know, they could be super helpful, super genuine to help you out. But the first thing that strikes their mind is, do I know you? Like, how far am I willing to go for you? So besides actually stepping out there and actually getting out there, I mean, getting your name out there, you also have to build a sort of rep. It is somewhat this way in university, I would say from my experience, where you have to have a give and take situation going on there. Like you have to show that you are able to actually dish out something for them where they can actually get something in return and then you can receive stuff from them. This way you build a sort of alliance between you guys and you guys like know you that you you both have like each other's backs in a way. Um, I think that is very important because in that way you get a whole new network of friends, you show them that you're serious about your cause and at the end of the day, everyone's happy. Yep, that's all from me, thank you. Thank you to our panelists who answered the questions. Now, moving on to our second question. This is from Miss Arisa Daniel. 
regarding Mastura's response, but isn't rewatching the recorded session time mo more time consuming as compared to asking friends who understand? I'd like to pass this to Miss Mastura. All right. Um, yeah, um, to answer, of course, rewatching a lecture session would be much more time consuming uh, other than rather than just asking our friends. But I don't know about anyone else, but for me, sometimes I get um, uh, I feel guilty to uh, catch out my friends. Uh, you know, because some, being someone that's slower than others, you feel like you're a burden if you keep on asking questions that were already in the lecture. I won't mind re-asking things that were taught in the lecture if I really truly didn't understand. But if it's something that I can understand on my own, I would opt to understand on my own uh, other than rather than menyusahkan my friends. So all, I think it all comes down to the person themselves. If they want to ask their friends, then go ahead. But having the lecture at hand, it would be really handy, especially since sometimes lecturers tend to give hints on what might be in the exams or what we have to focus on. And I think that's something that's valuable when rewatching lectures because, because sometimes when we do notes, we don't take note on whether it's important or not. But in lectures, if the lecturer themselves already said that this one is important, then maybe you, you'll be like, when you're rewriting the notes, you're okay, this one is important. So I guess um, it all comes down to the person themselves. Huh? Okay. May I add a bit? Like, yes, go ahead. <laughs> like from what Masura said, I truly understand that feeling of like not wanting to disturb your friends. But at the same time, one of the benefits of looking over the recorded lectures is that there are some things that even your classmates don't understand. That's why I said in my first point, when you're trying to find help, you got to detect the people who really understand that topic or who really is kind of master at it. So you never, unless you've already been to face-to-face -face classes, like for me, I can say I have an advantage because I personally know my classmates. I got to know them. I know their backgrounds and all that. So we have that form of trust. So maybe for people who have been in online classes since day one, y'all might not have that personal, you know, relationship between you guys. So you might not know how, what everyone's feeling, what everyone's capable of, you know what I'm trying to say? Um, and through rewatching the lectures, you could like really understand what the lecturer is trying to say. But from what Arisa said, like it might be time consuming and asking a friend who is more skilled in that topic might be a better alternative. And it's true, I can't deny that. Uh, having someone who is more skilled and properly trained or like really more knowledgeable on that topic to explain to you might be a better alternative, but it doesn't, it's, it's not, it doesn't harm you to like try to rewatch the lectures for tips and like main points from the lectures because at the end of the day, it's the lecturers who are going to test you, who are giving you the like, test answers, test questions. So yeah, I think there's pros and cons in that situation, but truly you got to know the people that you're trying to interact with. That's the most important thing. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Masura and Miss Afika for answering that question. Now, the third question would be from Bani Hadri Muhammad Roslan. Open question. Do you think that the ODL is practicing us to become more of an individualistic person or collectivistic kind of person? If so, do you think it's good for students and the learning outcome? I'll I, I think so I'll anyway. take this one. All right. Am I audible? Hello? OK. Um, can I can I have the, uh, the question back? Uh, I, I, I see there's two questions. OK. So the first question, uh, does ODL is practicing? Well, I think whether or not ODL is practicing us to become a more individualistic or, collect or a more collectivist person depends on how we approach online distance learning. Some people approach uh, online distance learning in a more independent way. 
uh, they do everything themselves. But some people, they still rely on their friends. They still have um, group discussions and they still have Zoom calls and they have each other to keep themselves up. So in that, in that way, I guess it makes you a more collectivist learner. But if you learn alone, then it makes, it makes you more individualistic. Can I see the second question again? I'm sorry. OK. Is it good or not uh, for students? And what is the learning outcome? Well, I think, I think it can be good. It can be bad. But that's not the right answer. I think the right answer is how you are as a person when it comes to learning. If you're more of an individualistic learner, then if you approach online distance learning in a more individualistic manner, then I think that would serve you best. But if you are a collectivistic type of learner, when you uh, require people around you to emotionally and academically support you, then I think you should approach that way of learning um, to do your best, to execute your best. Mm -hmm. So the learning outcome depends solely on your approach and solely on what you're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Mr. Hashil. Um, if there's no one, if nobody is going to add to any more, we're going to move on to questions from the comments. Oh, yeah. There's another question from Anonymous. A big portion of problems at home comes from family disagreements, as some use to escape these situations by residing on campus in order to focus in learning. What should they do now? Um, I think I may answer this. So basically, um, um, so you used, um, may I have the question back, please? Yeah, thank you. So a big portion of problems at home come from family disagreements. So basically what you're saying here is that when you are at home, you face these family disagreements and you feel that the only way for you to keep on focusing on your studies and all of that is by going to campus. So yeah, this is actually kind of tough because that was your only route for you to escape from what's happening at home. But then I feel that maybe you should use this opportunity, I think, so uh, to maybe mend things up or make things better. Or if just say you can't make it better, maybe um, maybe stay in your room. But then um, from my point of view, it's just that, okay, you do have problems at home and maybe it may affect your studies. But then, as I said, whenever there's a problem, there's always a solution. So maybe keep on trying to find solutions on how do you settle these problems. Or then else, uh, now that um, it is much more easier for us to move around, um, that the restrictions have been brought down, so maybe you can go to the library near your house or maybe have small study groups in your housing area so that um, it's not uh, as much of big as an improvement of moving to campus, but then it is something for you to maybe find a way to um, run away from your problems at home. But then for me, I feel that you should try to mend things up so that you won't have you won't face this difficulty in the future because we don't know how long we will be at home to go through this online learning process. So we need to be ready for every possible outcome that is going to come to come to us. So yeah, I hope that under, uh, answers your question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Amir, for that answer. Now, um. We have one last question from the YouTube comment section. This is from Mr. or Miss, I don't know, Mr. Shamir Aziz. Prior to online learning, what can we do if our teachers are ignoring us when we try to discuss and consult regarding our assignments and syllabus with them? Very intriguing question. Do any of the panelists would like to answer? All right. Um, I okay. I guess I'll go then. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. And uh, may I ask for the question to be on the screen so that I can make sure I'm answering the correct question? Okay. So prior to online, well, I think 
um, this can be a problem to a lot of students um, and oftentimes it is not their faults oftentimes sometimes lecturers also make mistakes like this but we don't know what situation they're facing maybe they too are having work a workload that is massive you know but what we can do when our lecturers or our teachers are ignoring us uh, when we're trying to discuss and consult regarding all of these things is just just try our best to communicate just try our best to somehow interact with our um, lecturer and somehow maybe just call them or we could also ask our peers you know what's going on um, if it is too critical but i think this um, communication between students and lecturers or teachers uh, is incredibly incredibly important in the process of learning because they are the ones that are providing us with uh, educational material and we, the, we are the ones receiving them so they should have the responsibility to let us be informed and we deserve to be informed so there's no need to feel shy in asking and trying our best to approach them mm. i agree with what hashil has had to say and i just want to add on maybe uh, in this certain circumstances, there's not much that we can do as a student because people will be people. And if people decide to do those, like be in that kind of situation, like ignore us, or maybe like Hashel said, some people have their own problems, some lecturers have heavy workload, then it's something that we can't really fix. Uh, the only solution that I can say about this is that it's something that we have to um, learn to overcome by ourselves. Uh, it, it may be a tricky thing to do right now, especially if you're a school student, but for my fellow peers who are already in their like university years, um, I think this is where we prepare ourselves to really dive into this independent learning style because once you go to university, you can't really fully depend on your lecturers or your friends at that. You really have to start being independent. And I think this is the time where we learn how to be more resourceful, how to really allocate the resources that we have on the internet, the modules, the textbooks, the libraries, the many, many books in this world. We really have to be more proactive by ourselves. And this might be troublesome for some people, but just know that that is why we live in a community. That's why we have classmates, we have peers, we have people from all around the world at that like the internet is such a wonderful place because even if the people around you can't help you, there must be someone in this world that is willing to help and willing to like make sure you understand a certain thing so if that one person who was um given the responsibility to teach you your lecturer in this situation isn't able to do that then you yourself must find a solution to overcome that problem and that is my suggestion which is to try your best to keep on thinking positive and not blame the lecturer and like not like sit in self-pity and like be overly upset by one simple thing that could be resolved if you really put the effort to overcome it. So that's just in my point of view. I think someone else has something to add on. Jonathan, yeah, maybe? Yeah, I have something. Yeah, totally. Um, I'll, I'll keep it short because I think we've actually addressed this question quite a number of times already. I think what Afika and Hasbira has said is so crucial, you know, actually, because people will be people. And if your lecturers the people who are supposed to give you your education do not actually provide to you, there's not much we can do because it's very difficult to actually go against them and this might start trouble. And, you know, honestly, we don't want all of that. But I think of it in another perspective in a way where it's actually a stepping stone to the working world. Because when you do go to the working world, you'll actually be independent. You will have to do all these things by yourself, not relying on anybody else. So being independent, starting that up in uni is super important. As um, Afika said earlier, we actually can use the internet to actually find out how we can actually make our, um, maybe our discussions, our syllable, syllabus, our assignments better in many, many ways. Um, and I think we actually have to make use of that. Since our topic today is online learning, we actually have to maximize that use. So yeah, I think that's all from me. Thank you so much. Okay, and I'll finish for this question. Um, since uh, the one asking is one of the students from KMB, I would actually uh, recommend you to 
since actually what he wants to say is that uh, our assignment and our, we have a thing called SNSC and we all have our personal advices but when a lot of us actually face um kena palau you know uh, being ghosted by our advices so for what <laughs> to solve that that you can actually approach other teachers as well but especially maybe like your homeroom teacher your mentor for advices that's what i would say that could solve for now and when we're back into campus in sem3 you can meet uh, your lecturer your advisor face to face from there inshallah you can communicate um better yeah that's that's it Thank you for all our fellow panelists for answering the questions today. Now that we're getting close to the end of our time, <clears throat> for the viewers, we would really appreciate it if you took your time and fill in the feedback form. You can get the form at the pinned message at the YouTube comment section. If there's anything that the audience would like to take away from this session, what would it be? Any hopes or last thoughts? But what I would like to say is to thank our people for joining this session today. Hopefully, it would help the students to overcome the hurdles of online learning. And thank you everyone for joining this live show from your home as well. And we hope you have a great day ahead. All right, so before we leave, we would like to have a round table with all our fellow panelists. So I'd like to invite our panelists to say or summarize their points given. Um, I think I'll summarize first. So um, as a conclusion to what we have discussed today about online learning and all of that. So we are now in the 21st century. Everything is technological. So Firstly, we need to improvise with what we have right now and try to make the best out of it. And then we adapt it, we use it in our daily lives, and we try to overcome the problems that we have. So remember these three things, which are we need to improvise, adapt, and overcome. Secondly is that do not make every single thing, every small thing, as an excuse to you to deteriorate in your studies and all of that. So always keep a positive mind, always be cheerful, always be happy, always see the good in everything and make sure that whatever you do, you do it at your best and you do it wholeheartedly. Yeah, that's all I have to say. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Amir. Now, our next panelist. Yes, sure. So just to wrap things up a little, online learning, it's crazy actually to actually think that we went from everything hard copy, traditional, to everything digital. Like we're sitting in our bedrooms and we are actually going for classes, which we can do. You know, it's it's crazy to think. And honestly, it isn't crazy that people are having a difficult time because everybody has their own pace and it is okay. So just do it at your own pace, move along, you'll get there. It's something that is totally new and you guys deserve to go at your own pace. This is a very difficult time. And I can see like all the student councils who are here today, they actually have like, you know, so much love for their own students. They really push for the betterment of the students. They really think about how online learning really affects the students. And I think they surely have uh, methods to actually improve the online learning in their universities. Um, but yeah, to wrap it all up, just do you, you got this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jonathan. Moving on to our third panelist.
who would like to summarize? All right. Um, I would say that firstly, thank you to everyone who tuned in and watched our forum from the start till the end. It's been two hours now. And I hope, I would just say that I pray that every one of us will be able to get through this because I know it's not an easy period. No matter how long we do online learning, there will always be new challenges. But, but I hope everyone hangs in there. We can do this until the end. And remember that learning and anything that's good for you will, ne will never be easy. So whatever challenges that you're facing now, uh, just be positive that it'll make you into, it'll shape you into a better person in the future. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Mastura. Now we have our fourth panelist. Okay, I can, I can, I can go next. Uh, I think they've said a lot already and all the points are valid and amazing. Uh, what, I just want to say one more thing in regards to one of the questions before, uh, in regards to family problems or problems that are inevitable that honestly you shouldn't be worrying about as a student and someone who is young, you should be focusing on your studies. But in these situations, I surely want to advise you to seek help never stop seeking help and my advice is to seek professional help either from your counselors or if you may find a psychiatrist or if you can't find those people just at least find your people the people who you trust most at least have someone by your side and even if you don't have those people let's say you're an introvert or you just like to stay by yourself i don't recommend that for yourself because i recommend you to tell your problems to someone and I'm sure online there's so many outlets and so many websites that are willing to help these people who are in need uh, be it in uh, for mental health be it for domestic violence or those kind of things never stop seeking help and know that there are many people here for you don't go through this alone you're strong everybody here is 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 worthy of attention, worthy of help. So never put yourself in a situation where you're going to feel down and think that you're going to fail because no, you have the option to succeed. And once you believe in that, there's nothing that's going to stop you. So that's all I have to say. I think everybody keep your chins up and may you have a wonderful and blessed life. Thanks all. That's all from me. Thank you, Miss Afika. And lastly, we have our last panelist. Mr. Hashwell. Okay. <clears throat> so from this whole session, I think we can get that the idea that um, technology has been present in our education, educational syllabus, although it was not apparent back there. And now it's very, very apparent. I think we should take this positively. We should take this as a learning journey you know it's the 21st century so one one time we're, we're going to eventually have to adapt to this whole new thing right but being in this situation and being shocked with this whole transformation i think the most important value that i think we should all uphold from all the previous panelists opinions is that we should cherish this value of love you know, now we really, really should. Uh, we don't need to just uh, rely on our friends to come to us and express uh, their feelings. We should just go out and reach out to as many people as we can and just be very, very altruistic and be very, very nice. And we would get the same responses in return. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also important that we all realize that we are all facing the same thing and that we should also understand that we are not alone in all of this. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Hashwell. Well, we can look at the time and it's now 11.30 and the event is currently reaching its end. I would like to thank the panelists and also the audience for joining the live show. And I hope that this forum has given all the audience or the panelists even some great insight 
on what is currently happening in our educational system. Now that is about to end, I wish that everyone has a great day ahead and thank you for tuning in. Goodbye.